Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Hoy. The Psychology Talk podcast is a unique conversation about psychology from around the globe. We bring you ideas from mental health practitioners and experts to keep you informed about the latest issues and trends. Topics include developments and research in psychotherapy and social sciences, hypnosis and mind-body treatments, meditation and spirituality, and new treatment modalities. And while you're listening, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a review at your favorite streaming site. It helps us to grow and further reach people with quality programming. And now, here's the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today, my guest is author, speaker, educator, and minister, Matt Dix. Matt is the author of Someday is Today, 22 Simple Actionable Items to Propel Your Creative Life from New World Library. This book is really engaging. In fact, Matt basically asks the question, how might people get in their own way with successfully doing things and how can they do these simple moves to dig themselves out? In fact, as I was reading it, I I realized he was just succinctly distilling a lot of basic psychology into easily digestible stories and actionable items. Today, Matt will be discussing those actionable items and much, much more here on the Psychology Talk podcast. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excellent. Well, you're, you're, like I said in the intro, your book really is engaging, full of cool stories. You're a storyteller. Uh, you are an educator, and you've been doing that for some time. And, and it just seems like you really have kind of built in from what you're saying in the book. You've, you've built into your own life ways to do things quickly, easily, uh, I guess, shortcuts. But in a way, they're not shortcuts. It's kind of like lifestyle management that yeah. works. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, the question I get asked the most often in life is, how do you do all the things that you do? You know, I end up standing in front of groups of people, whether I'm talking about a novel or telling a story or delivering a keynote. And when we get to that Q&A, people always say, you're a teacher, you're an author, you run businesses, you do all these things. How do you manage to do it? And I've always felt like if you would just give me 17 hours, I would be happy to help you. But no one ever wants to give me 17 hours. So, (laughs) you know, I would offer like three strategies and they'd go on their way. And I always think like, I didn't really help them. You know, that, that wasn't super helpful. So the book is the attempt to answer the question, sort of how do you get all the things done that you want to get done whether that is professionally or creatively, or really you just want to find more time to spend with your family or your friends or with yourself. You know, if your goal is to spend more time on the couch watching black and white movies from the 1940s, and that brings you joy, I want to make sure you have as much time to do that as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about some of these, some of these items maybe that, and, and, uh, and how people can kind of, uh, instill a few of them into their life or install them into their life? Well, the book's divided into sections. And so the first section is the one that people seem to be able to focus on the most in terms of making immediate changes in their life, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's all based upon the principle of time, really. You know, it's the idea that so often in life, people see time in chunks. So they see something as, well, I have 30 minutes, I have an hour, I can't do anything unless I have an hour to do it in. And I encourage people to stop looking at time in terms of how much time is built around that time. You know, look at minutes as valuable, not a minute is only valuable when it's attached to 14 other minutes or or 29 other minutes, but a singular minute can really be something meaningful if you make it something meaningful. And I think what happens in life is we dither away these little increments of time that could have been useful to us. You know, my wife calls them the little black holes. She says, I fill all of my little black holes with something productive. Either I'm making myself happy with those little black holes, or I'm doing something I need to get done so I can be happy or productive later on. So we have to stop thinking about time in chunks and rather in the singular minutes of our day. Yeah. Well, it seems like you started, you know, according to your your, your story in the book, you know, your history, you seem to, to really be proactive early on in life at and filling up the time in, in meaningful, you know, chunks or whatever. 
Yeah, well, I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't as good as I wish I could have been earlier in life. You know, for me, when I was 22, I was robbed at gunpoint um, as, you know, managing a McDonald's restaurant. Yeah. You know, and, and it was a terrible, it was a terrible moment. You know, I was, I was beaten and a gun was put to my head and um, the trigger was pulled and there was a countdown from three and, and all of that, you know, in that time, in that moment in an office in the back of a restaurant, I really thought I was at the end of my life. You know, I genuinely was 100% certain I was about to die. And the astounding thing about that moment for me was that I didn't feel sad or angry or even scared. The only feeling I was filled with was regret that I was 22 and I had dreams and I had yet to begin chasing those dreams. And you know, ever since that moment, I've sort of become relentless about the idea that when I get to that last day, you know, when it actually comes, I want to be able to look back and know that I used my time wisely. And that means used the six minutes I have while waiting for my son to find his shoes, you know, and the three minutes I had while, you know, waiting for my daughter to get out of the shower, all of those little bits of time, I want to look back and think those minutes were used well too. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's a really rough way to learn that lesson. I <laughs> it mean, is, obviously, yes. uh, but it sounds like if, if you had to go back in time, would you not learn that lesson or would you have learned it differently? I mean, <laughs> I that's, always, a, that's, yeah. a rough, that's a difficult question for me to ask. Cause I know you must've suffered from, PTSD for years after that. Yeah. And it was untreated for a long time. You know, when my wife met me, you know, she would, she finally said to me, like, why do you wake up in the middle of the night screaming and in mortal terror? And I say, well, it's like everybody else has something. I said, some people play tennis, some people collect stamps. This is my thing. And my wife pointed out that it's not a thing. And um, eventually she got me into therapy and it took a long time. What I just told you would have been impossible to even say 10 years ago, say those words out loud would have been impossible. So I imagine, yeah, yeah. It's hard. I've I've actually asked myself the question you just asked me, which is like if I could go back in time, you know, it's really challenging. What I would like to think is I could have garnered the wisdom in some other way without having to deal with all of that trauma. I'm not sure if it's possible. My goal in life is to sort of offer that wisdom to other people absent the trauma. You know, hopefully they will listen to me yeah. and at least it can be productive in some way. Oh, I think you, you use a novel kind of mental trick to do that or mental technique. Like maybe you can talk about that. I think you call it the 100 year old self. Yes. Yeah. It's the idea that the, the current version of me, you know, the one that's speaking to you right now is fairly unreliable in terms of decision-making. You know, if you, you know, if you offered me two hours and said, do whatever you want, it's probably going to be golf and a cheeseburger, you know, maybe paddle boarding with my son, which is probably the best of all those choices. But I understand that if you want to achieve things and you have a life and a vision that you want, and I think everyone should, we have to think long-term as well. And so when I'm, when I come upon a decision, how to spend the next two hours, how to spend the next week, what goal do I want to chase next? I always ask the hundred year old version of myself, that one at the end of his life. You know, I always imagine him lying on a bed, finally binging Netflix for the first time in his life because he can't do anything else. And I ask that version of myself, what should I do in this moment? And that version always seems to have the right idea. So that version of me has never told me to binge Netflix, you know, never don't spend eight hours on a couch watching a television show that you will ultimately never remember, or don't spend 12 minutes doom scrolling on Instagram or Twitter, you can use that 12 minutes to maybe write eight good sentences of the novel that you're working on or fold half of the laundry so you don't have to fold the other half later on. Or your son is running around the car waiting for everyone to get ready. Go outside and run around the car with him. That that would be a joyous thing to do. That person just has more wisdom than I have in this moment. I think the trap is that when we make decisions based upon the singular moment that we're in, those decisions tend to be fleeting and foolish. Right. Yeah. And then we wonder where, why we haven't gotten further with the, you know, everyone's going to be the next writing the next great American novel or great German, you know, Roman or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everybody wants to do that, but they always kind of, like you say, flitter away time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that I, the book is called someday is today because I just think someday is a trap. Everyone thinks that I'm going to do that someday. 
And then what happens is they just die. I, I really believe that most people think they're going to do the thing they've always dreamed of someday. And then they simply run out of time. Well, I, I think you pick up on something there. Like you, you really, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head with that word. And I think as a psychologist, uh, seeing people in practice over the years, words are really, really powerful, right? Like a double-edged sword. And if, if you find yourself, I mean, a lot of times uh, a therapeutic move will be for me to say, well, look, you just said, you just said this about yourself or this about this action. Let's unpack that. Is there another way you could say that that's more empowering to you and to the people in your lives? Right. And I think that you, you hit the nail on the head with that word. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a permission. It's permission to procrastinate really. It's like a promise to yourself that will never be fulfilled because ultimately you either reach the point in your life where that dream can no longer be chased or you just end up at the end of your life. I just learned that David Cassidy, the, the musician, you know, world famous musician, the last thing he said before he passed away, he said it to his daughter. He said so much wasted time. And that's David Cassidy. You know, my insurance selling neighbor across the street, you know, he is not David Cassidy. And I watch him dither his time away. And I think, what are you going to be feeling at the end of your life if David Cassidy is reflecting on wasted time? What does the average person feel at the end of their life if they're not in tune to what they want, you know, the dreams that they have and the path that they're currently on? Right, exactly. Well, maybe we can kind of like, zero in on um on that idea of hope that is is a huge part of what draws people forward you know like a, a kind of we, we might a technical term might be teleological or goal directed behavior like but if you don't really see something as inspirational and pulling t- you towards it as a person uh hope is a really good way to put it right you know like, yeah. like, talk a little bit about that well i remember you know, there was a time in my life right during that time when I was robbed, where I was homeless and I was, um, I was jailed. I was facing trial for a crime I did not commit. And I remember coming as close to feeling hopeless as I've ever felt in my life. And it was the most debilitating feeling I have ever experienced. The idea that no positive action will result in a positive result. So what I tell people is that We have to find hope in small things. I think that we tend to want success in big gulps and magic pills. And when we can start to realize that when we make small changes in our lives, over time, they can produce enormous results. And when we make a bunch of small changes in our lives that are productive and meaningful, we have to have the hope and the belief that tomorrow will be better because we've changed something small about today. You know, a word that often is used in this is incrementalism, the belief that small changes over time produce something meaningful. But people have to understand that and they have to have hope that one small thing, you know, compounded over time means a lot. And I think oftentimes people don't believe that because they see people at the top of the mountain and they assume that they either began at the top of the mountain or it was two leaps and they got up there. One of the things I love to do is to encourage people to study the history of someone they admire, some someone who's reached a level of success, because inevitably, you really can't find a successful person who didn't have enormous failure and struggle along the way. And once we recognize that we're just tragically human, like that person is also tragically human, they're just ahead of us on the path, that is all, but the path is the same. Once we recognize that, I think we can find a lot more hope in the idea that I can do the same thing that person did. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about like psychological modeling, which is, you know, very powerful. And we do it, you know, everything, everything your psychologist, your therapist talks about, for instance, in the consulting room is probably something you've done naturally. It's just, you're not, you're not doing it on purpose. You're just kind of, you know, like you internalize a role model, for instance, like you, you mentioned your, your instructor in, in high school who, who gave you the uh, lesson of learning about satire, right? Which, yeah. which is a fantastic story. You, you welcome to talk about that if you want. Uh, but I'm sure you must've internalized that as a kind of, uh, eventually you became a teacher. You've know, you been right. an educator for years. 
Yeah. Yeah. For about 25 years, I've been teaching elementary school. Wow. Uh, and, you know, it started probably with, you know, what you said, which was Mr. Campo Piano, my English teacher, mm-hmm. teaching us about satire in a time in my life when I was about to be kicked out of my house. You know, I was going to graduate high school and now live on my own. No one had ever mentioned the word college to me, even though I was a successful student. I was also incredibly poor. And so growing up without money, I think the assumption was he can't go to college. So we're never going to bother to mention it to him. So I never took SATs. I never, I never set foot in the guidance office. No guidance counselor ever came to speak to me. And my parents were sort of absent from my life. So while my friends were sort of planning safety schools and, you know, targeting careers, I was wondering when they, my parents kicked me out after I graduate, how will I eat and where will I live? And that's when I came upon Mr. Campo, who taught me about satire and encouraged us to write. And so I was thrilled. I had never give, been given the permission to write something sarcastic, funny, and pars- you know possibly biting before. And mm-hmm. so it was all the things that were already inside me. So I wrote something. I thought it was the most fantastic thing an American had ever written in the history of our country, handed it in. And got it back and it was a B minus. And I was just so angry. He wrote, it was too obvious. He said, not satire, too obvious. I still have the assignment. It is in the file cabinet just to the right of me. (laughs) And uh, so I charged to the front of the room and I told him he was crazy. And we, we had a fight, you know, we argued quite a bit. And finally he said, read it to the class. And um, if they agree with you, I'll turn your B minus into an A minus. But if they agree with me, your B minus becomes a C minus, which was a great teaching lesson, raise the stakes on kids. And so I stood in front of my class and for the first time in my life, I spoke aloud words that I committed to paper. I performed for the first time in in front of a group of people. And I was like two or three sentences in when the girl who I had a crush on all my life laughed. And, you know, right after that, other people started laughing. By the time I was done, everyone was laughing. And when Mr. Campo said, raise your hand if you think it was actually satire, Every hand in the room went up, including Mr. Campos. You know, he said, it's not satire on the page, but you bring so much life to it. It sounds just like satire. So he scratches out the B minus angrily, writes a reluctant A minus on the top. And that changes my life because suddenly I realize if I can write things and maybe even perform them, I can make girls laugh, which I still to this day, it is one of the primary reasons I commit things to paper and write, keep my wife sort of interested in me and looking in my direction. I made a teacher look foolish, which we don't usually get to do. We like to think we did it, but I genuinely told a teacher his professional opinion was wrong. And then he agreed with me that that was astounding to me. I challenged authority in a meaningful way. But the most important thing that happened to me was I felt like I had changed my future. And I didn't have a future before I changed my future. You know, I I changed a B minus into an A minus. I probably didn't change my grade on the report card that year, but I felt like I spoke and something changed. And that was so important to me. And so on Monday, I started my first business. I started writing term papers for my classmates. I started doing their assignments. And (laughs) with the money I earned, I bought my first car and I was on my way. You know, and I, it is not an exaggeration to say that every single day, Since that day in Mr. Campos' class, I have written. I have written something every day since then. So it changed my life in a profound way. It gave me hope. It is that word hope, right? It's the idea that I did a small thing and I feel like I have changed my life in a little way. I wonder if I can do that again and again and again. And and I was off and running. So but some really subtle things happened there. Like, Like you met the mind of the teacher in a way. And he allowed you to, to meet his mind in a way that it can kind of reframed and flip things for you. It, it, and it also for him, he changed his mind. You helped him change his mind, uh, knowing full well that he could hear your voice as a speaker. Yeah. I, and as a teacher today, so many of the things that I do that make me success, successful, I'm not the best designer of lessons and I'm not the best deliverer of content. The thing that I do that allows me to be successful is I tell stories to kids about my life. I encourage them to tell stories about their lives to me. We meet in the middle. And once they know me, deeply understand me, and I feel the same way about them, they're willing to run through walls for me. So when when it comes time to teach long division, my colleagues are better at teaching long division than I am, but my kids are remarkably enthusiastic about learning long division because we are in the same boat and we're all pulling on the same oar. Wow. Okay. Well, I mean, you're, you're hitting on something there that's super important, uh, 
which is encouragement, which a lot of children don't receive enough of. I think that many of us as adults can look back on our own upbringings and say, there were those little sparks like your teacher in high school or, or elsewhere, often outside of the, the, the family unit, right? Yeah. And, and some encouragement within the family unit to a certain degree, but that's such a huge, huge, I mean, that's a, that's a seed to be planted is, is encouragement and connection. Yeah. I think that especially, especially once kids get to sort of the ages of eight, nine and 10, let's say, and they can read, you know, and they can write, I actually think the need or importance of content falls away completely. You know, there was a moment when I was prepared to teach the pre-colonial economic structure of the middle colonies to my students, my 10 year olds. And one of my kids said, what is polysexual? Just sort of out of the blue, like that question had been lingering in this kid's head. And because I tell stories and kids feel connected to me, they, they asked me the craziest things. And I remember making a calculation. I said, well, we're going to talk about polysexuality, or we're going to talk about the economic structure of the middle colonies and pre-colonial America. And I knew right away that we were going to talk about polysexuality because the other thing is not as relevant, not as important. And the way the world is constructed today, everyone has access to content. Like facts are no longer as valuable as they used to be because they're at our fingertips. What is valuable is I understand how to work with people. I understand myself. I know how to apply myself to something over a long period of time. I understand the importance of focus. I know what I need in order to make myself the best possible learner. All of those things are so much more important than the knowledge that teachers impart. We have to think of ourselves as more of sort of guides or coaches in terms of work habits habits and, and thinking and self-worth. It's just not as important to teach kids about content these days because of the way the world is. Yeah. I, I even noticed back when I was in high school, I have a good friend who who had to go to the hospital for several months and he was able to keep up with his schooling. He said, okay, I have to be here. I have to treat this thing, <laughs> but I want to get, I want to graduate with everyone else. Right. And he liked yeah. learning. So he had to deal with his instructors. They sent the syllabi, they sent the, the, the books were there for him. He turned everything in and he graduated on time. He, he, yeah. he didn't miss a, miss a beat. In fact, I asked him about that. And, and Lee was like, well, you know, the best thing that ever happened to me was getting sick with anorexia, going to the hospital and, you know, sorry, Lee, if I'm mentioning that you had anorexia, <laughs> sorry about that. But, but the main thing is that what he taught me was that you have to be an autodidact, right? And so from his, from his uh, trauma, from his experience of, of having to go through this and on top of like building himself up mentally, he also learned that you could teach yourself, right? And, and the content is available even back in pre-internet days, the content was available, but it's, it's that I can think that inner drive or hope or, or whatever it is that pulls you forward, right? And what I think you're instilling in children while, while you're talking about this is is that connection and process and and encouragement, right? Yeah, I, I think that is the thing that we as teachers need to do the most. To, I, you know, I'm in the middle of my summer right now. Today, I wrote three notes and I mailed them. You know, I like physical letters to three of my former students. They are no longer my students. They're going on to middle school. But today, Latavia, Michaela, and Sean received notes from me. It took me 10 minutes to write them, just asking them, how's your summer? Hope you're reading. Hope you're still writing. Going to miss you next year. I'm always here for you if you need me. And just sent those three notes out. You know, and I, yeah. I mail notes to my students all year long. They think I'm crazy at first because in September, they'll be like, why did you mail me a letter? And I just, I want them to know that when they're in their home, their teacher is still present and thinking of them. You know, I also want to be able to say things to them in a letter that they don't have to sort of open up in front of their classmates and have their classmates look over their shoulder, you know, and I want to tell them something that they can hold on to, you know, words are fleeting. And so if I say something important to a kid in writing and I put a stamp on it in an envelope, maybe they throw it away. But if they're a kid who needs that thing, they need to be reminded of it. They're likely to hold on to those letters. And I think there's value 
in the permanence of something like that. And so I lean into that kind of encouragement whenever possible, the kind of encouragement that not only moves them forward, but gives them something that they can keep going back to again and again, a well that they can draw from moving forward in life. And I think that's why so many of my former students are now my friends. Like weirdly, they're now grown up people who I play golf with and, you know, stopped by my classroom and came to my surprise birthday party, you know, uh, babysitters for my children, all these, you know, I never expected as a teacher that I would be playing golf with my 24 year old former third grade student, but he stayed in my life throughout my life and suddenly we're kind of pals. Yeah. I think that's a mark of a great teacher. I've, I've had uh, several of those. I've been lucky to have those in high school and, and elsewise where I just, if I bump into them or if I reach out to them, they're there and, and we connect and on a different level, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing. Well, it sounds like I, I take from the story of your early upbringing, you didn't have a whole lot of connection in the home, but somehow that, how did that shift for you? It seems like there's like, you've created, I mean, not only do you have your own family and your lovely wife and children, but you also have with this wider connection, like, but it doesn't sound like that. That sounds like that was lacking initially for you in your life, Matt. Yeah. You know, my parents got divorced when I was young and my father disappeared from my life and a really terrible stepfather came into my life for a period of time and wasn't very helpful to me. And, you know, my mother for a long time, I believed she sort of wasn't the best mother in the world, you know, and she's passed. Um, And then I'll never forget, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I was talking about my mother and talking about sort of how I wish she had done something differently. Mm -hmm. And my wife said to me, who barely knew my wife, who barely knew my mother, she knew her for about a year and a half before my mother passed away. My wife said to me, Matt, you know, your mother was depressed for all her life, right? And it had never occurred to me. But the moment she said it, I was absolutely certain it was true, that my mother was depressed all her life, untreated, undiagnosed, unmedicated, And as soon as she said it, everything made sense to me. Suddenly my whole childhood, I went, oh, that's what was going on, you know? And I was unable to see it. And so, yeah, it was messy. And, you know, my therapist always reminds me how easily it would have been for me to go down another path, you know, which gives me enormous empathy that I used to not have. You know, my therapist says people who went through things like you went through, Matt, often end up addicted to some substance as a means of, you know, dealing with the struggle that they have by medicating it in their own way. And that creates enormous problems for you, for them. So he said, you got really lucky that somehow you came out the other side without any of these issues that, you know, um, and it's a good reminder of how lucky I am and also affords me the empathy to think when I see someone struggling that not everyone is as fortunate as I am. Yeah, I, I think I think your therapist is is on to something very, very much, very clearly there. Uh, one of the stories you mentioned in the book, and I'll I'll try to tag this back. We'll see if I can connect the <laughs> you know the breadcrumb trail back in and out of the, the forest here. Um, but uh, one of the stories you talk about, you you ace the LSAT, you're you you like to talk, you're you were pro debater, right? Uh, likable guy. You were going to be this, you know, next Atticus Finch, right? You were going to be the next, um, a, you know, star attorney somewhere uh, on television uh, or whatever, you know, and, and I assume that, that there was money involved in that. You saw the dollar signs of working in law firms or having your own firm, but then you, you, you noticed I would be giving up a heck of a lot. I would lose my, my quality of life would go down immensely. And I know that because I used to be a paralegal at one point and among other things. And my wife is an attorney and she always tells people do this before you decide to go to law school, spend and talk to lawyers to like me or go work in a law firm in some capacity and see how it, what it looks like. And then make your decision. If you love it, do it. But maybe you can maybe you can kind of flesh that out a little bit and and why I mean and, and the lesson behind that one of the one of the uh, actionable items that's in there. You can talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I've you know a couple times you know that time and then later on when I thought about becoming a high school English teacher, both times I said to myself, "Well, I'm going to make a big change here if I decide to move forward with this." And I just thought I should be the most knowledgeable person 
that I can be before I make this change. I think people have sort of enormous hubris in believing they understand what the future is going to hold for them based upon the decisions they make. It's so crazy. Like, you know, I tell people to say yes to every opportunity. And and so often I see people say no to an opportunity because they think they won't like it or they know they won't like it or they know it would be bad for them. Rather than what I say is open the door, say yes, walk through the door, give it a try. And then if you realize it's not for me, then then step back. But if you never open the door, if you never say yes to the opportunity, you you never know what you missed out on. A yes can always become a no. But once you've said no to something, it's rare that the door will open again. So for me, with the with the law, I went and took the LSAT. I did very well on it. I started exploring law schools. And then in order to walk through that door, I spoke to some of my attorney friends and asked them, not only is what your job, you know, what is your job like, but what do you think your job would be like for me? Like, how would you envision me as an attorney? And all of them, I'll never forget. One of my buddies just shook his head. He was like, no, no, bad idea. He's like, you're anti-authoritarian. And in a courtroom, you have to be deferential. He said, I've never seen you deferential once in your life. He said, you can't adhere to a single dress code. Like no matter what it is, you have to like always be dressing down and inappropriately. That's not going to work in the law. He said, you love to say things that are sort of like on the line and over the line. I do stand up comedy. He's like, you cannot be on the line or over the line in the law. He said, it will be a disaster for you. And then the other tip I always give people is, Don't only ask the person who does the job, ask the spouse of the person who does the job. So when I was thinking about becoming a high school English teacher, the person that convinced me it would be a terrible idea was the husband of one of my friends who was an English teacher. And he said to me, well, Jenny works five days a week at school. And then on Saturday, she spends the entire day at the dining room table reading bad essays, complaining about them and grading them. And I thought... That sounds terrible. And it's the truth for English teachers is they have to read a lot of terrible writing by people who think they're doing brilliant work like I did with Mr. Campo, right? He had to read my bad essay and and deal with me. And right away, I realized, why would I ever leave my beautiful elementary school classroom where, you know, I've established a reputation and I work with kids I love. And sure, they don't write, you know, they don't write brilliantly, but they write well enough and I can find good writing elsewhere. So you got to step through the door, take a good, honest look around. And then if you decide, no, it's not for me, you close the door and walk out, you know, move on to the next one. That also, you know, uh, getting back to uh, how I was trying to, to, to kind of connect this back to what we were talking about, you know, yourself and you, you get to know yourself more and more in life by asking these questions. You see the shiny object on the hill, but you don't run, run up to it. You ask people at the bottom in, in, the, in the foothills of the mountain, what is that thing up there? What am, yeah. Should I go after that object? You know, like, <laughs> so you don't like, but, but you do that. And then you add to your, your, your Santa Claus bag, so to speak, of, of your consciousness. And you go, okay, well, I know myself, but I don't want that. You know, right. Yeah. I I think I I tried the steak over at that restaurant and it's not as good as the one closer to the house or whatever. Right. But you tried it at least, you know? Yeah. I think, I think the tragedy in life is that so many people, I think almost everyone spends an enormous time thinking about their spouse, partner, children, parents, clients, neighbors, customers. I don't think people often spend time actually just thinking about themselves as a storyteller. Most of the storytellers that I know, the good ones, we're deeply curious about ourselves because we're always looking for the next story to tell. And the more you probe yourself, the more you find something, you turn over a rock and suddenly you discover a great story to tell. But most people, I don't think, do that. I think they're worried about everybody else. So I say that storytellers are self-centered in a positive way, meaning we carve out a little bit of time every day to say, who am I? Where am I? Am I happy where I'm going? Why do I do this the way that I do it? And I do think it creates self-awareness and it allows you to sort of look at the horizon and point yourself in the direction that's going to be best for you rather than what I think most people do, which is follow lives with the path of least resistance. I think most people are like water down a mountain, mostly doing what other people and the world thinks is appropriate for them, as opposed to sort of striking out in that slightly more difficult path that will get them to the place they've always wanted to be. Well, yeah. I mean, was it was it Plato who said the the un was it the unreflective life is not worth living? Was it Plato? Uh, I think he said it, and then um, um, 
what's his name came along and did it again. Aristotle. Um, no, the American who was by the by the pond. Oh, Walden. <laughs> Walden, uh, thank uh, you. Uh, Thoreau, yeah. yeah, he's been coming yeah. on my radar the last couple of days. So maybe I have to go back and read Walden or Civil Disobedience again. Yeah, yeah I think, I think yes, a lot of people have quoted that and said, ah, I wish I had said that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, they could just do it instead. If they just examined yeah. their life, yeah. that might also be productive. You know, I think that, you know, in my book, I talk about, I think people just do the easiest thing. And so if you find yourself with six minutes, the easiest way to spend the six minutes is there's already a phone in your pocket. So why not take it out and scroll through it? That is just the easiest decision people make rather than Mm -hmm. what could I do in these six minutes that might be productive, meaningful, spark joy in my life, all of those things. Yeah, exactly. Right. And and I think that, um, I think, you know, I have, I have, I see a lot of different people in my practice and uh, some of them are straight, some of them are LGBTQ identified or, you know, you know, transgendered or, or whatever. I always tell my straight patients, I think you should, you should out yourself. As straight? Like when I, yeah. Straight as straight. What do I mean by that? It, you should take an inventory of why you're straight. Why do you, why are you straight? I mean, most of it's kind of built into us, I think from I genetically, but like right. just as a, as a means to like really know what you like and why do you like this? Why, you know, why are you attracted to Beyonce versus I don't know, Jennifer Garner? Like why, you know, why? That wh- is fascinating. Is yeah. I think about that though. Cause, cause really, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice and people, you know, the unfortunate people who've had to go through hell, you know, being closeted or if, if that's still an option, I don't even think it, most people care in, in, in most, most cities and in, in larger towns, most people don't care what your sexuality is anymore. But when I was growing up and my friends were closeted, it was hell for them. Yeah. But they had to take an inventory of what, what they were going through. So always take an inventory of why, even down to the granular, I think, to say why you like this. What is it about it? And just so you know yourself better. Yeah. I like to ask that question of myself. I talk about it in my storytelling book. I like to identify things that I do in my life that make no sense to me and then determine why I do them. So, you know, an example I like is a couple of years ago, I was playing golf with my friend, Steve. It was 102 that day. Wow. And we were on the sixth hole and he said, Hey, I have an extra Gatorade. He noticed that I was sort of dying. Do you want my extra Gatorade? And I said, no. And as soon as I said it, I thought, why do you always do that? You always say no. And it wasn't until I got in the car and the air conditioning was on, Steve pulled away. I afforded myself a moment to say, why do you always do that? Why do you do the things that you do? Why did you refuse that Gatorade? Because you really needed it. And he had an extra one. And as soon as I asked myself the question, I knew the answer. I grew up hungry as a kid. And when you're hungry as a kid, you quickly discover it's better to be hungry than to be ashamed. Never admit to your hunger because admitting to your hunger is admitting to the fact that your family doesn't have something they should have. And so I trained myself as a kid to never say yes when someone offered me food. Also, because you can never reciprocate. If you don't have enough food for yourself, you're never going to be able to say to somebody, hey, do you want half of my whatever it is, right? Yeah. And so I was 46 years old, climbing up a hill with a golf bag on my back in 102 degree heat. But I was also still a 10 year old boy refusing all offers of food and drink because somewhere along the way, I learned not to do that because to do it would cause shame. And it changed the whole way I look at things in my life today. I suddenly understood I have always done that. I don't think I've ever accepted the gift of food from someone until that moment on the hill when I finally asked myself, why do you do the things that you do? And I just think most people don't do that. Even if they have that feeling on the hill, I think they then get in the car, go home and move on with their lives instead of saying, let me sit here for a minute and try to figure out why I just did that. There's usually a reason. And as a storyteller, I'll tell you, it's often a good story. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, uh, yeah. And, and and I think the, the book is largely about not, you, know, you can correct me if you, if you like, but for me, the book was a takeaway, a large takeaway was do things consciously, be yeah. conscious of why you do things. And, you know, if you want to have more space for X, Y, or Z in your life, you know, like you said, chunk it down, make sure that you have granular time, uh, 
not frittered away, but used productively. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I think part of it is to the importance of sort of maintaining your spirit. You know, I think that even when people have sufficient amounts of time to complete something, you know, to accomplish a goal or to chase a dream, I think the other side of it is, do they believe they can do it? Have they created a support system around them that will help them get there? And have they calculated for those days when things are going to feel hopeless, when it feels like all is impossible? If you plan for those days ahead of time and sort of prepare yourself, prepare systems and and processes that you can use, recognizing those days will come, that's going to help you. Because I think quitting is probably the most prevalent reason why people don't chase their dreams is they took a couple steps forward, they got smacked in the face, and then they decided to stop chasing that dream. Yeah. Um don't recall if you mentioned this in the book is like taking a, like when you take a step back uh, from something like, for instance, I, I have a woodworking project going on that, you know, I go, I go through it in steps for a number of different reasons. But like uh, if I take a break from it, I go back to it and then I realize it's not so bad after all. Right. <laughs> have you ever put a? you've obviously taken, like if you've written a joke down, you say, Ugh. you get, you get sick of your own jokes and you put them away in a drawer and you pull them out later. Oh, this isn't so bad. Right. Yeah. I, right. I make the argument in the book that you should be a chicken, not a pig. You know, the old saying is if you're going into a restaurant business, you want to go into business with a pig because for breakfast, they're going to commit the bacon. In other words, the pig is going to give up its life for the restaurant, whereas a chicken's just going to lay a couple eggs and then move on. It's not giving up anything other than eggs. But I think being a pig is a mistake because if you're committing everything to woodworking, and right. you don't like what you're doing and you take that step back, you often don't have anything else. Like there's nothing else for you. If right. you're a chicken and you filled your life with passion and you have several things to do as a writer, I tell people, don't just be working on one thing. That's insanity. Cause there will be a day when you're stuck. And when right. you're stuck, you're either going to stare at the screen and feel bad about yourself. Or you're going to say, you know what? Today isn't the day for this one, but today is the day for this one instead. So have a multitude of lay a lot of eggs so that on those days when you can't, make progress in one realm, you can go to the other one and feel good about yourself on those days. Yeah. Because you're reinforcing, if you just continue looking at like the blank screen on, on the chapter, you can't finish or even start. What's that going to do? What is it going to reinforce bad feelings about sitting in front of the computer? Right. Yeah. It's the idea that we're planning for those days. You have to be ready on the days when things aren't working well, what are you going to do on the day things aren't working well? If your choice is hide under a blanket, you're, that's not only going to hurt you on that day, but I think it sort of saps you from momentum and drive for future days as well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what what haven't we covered in the book that you might like want to uh, to discuss a bit? Like what what in there? Like what are some of your favorite? portions or, 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 or techniques in the book for you? I guess one of the things that seemed to, it's seemed to be easy for people to do and they begun doing it. I'm getting a lot of emails about it is, you know, as an elementary school teacher, I know the power of the negative comment versus the positive comment. You know, mm-hmm. unfortunately we're wired to remember negativity more than positivity, which is great if we're hunter gatherers, you know, we need to remember that bush killed uncle John and that cave has a bear that will eat you. But, you know, today we live in a world with doors and Doritos at every turn, like our actual physical safety is not often at peril. And yet our brains are still wired to live in a perilous world where we remember the negativity. So as a teacher, I know that I have to say six positive things to a kid before I can counteract a negative thing. And our lives are not built that way. We do not receive six positive statements for every negative statement in our lives, most of us. So what I suggest to people is to engineer that for yourself. So the simplest way that I do it and what people have started to do is whenever I receive an email a tweet, a Facebook message, whatever it is, with something kind, a little bit of kindness or something effusively complimentary, I save it. I actually have a, I have a folder, a document inside the folder where I copy and paste all of the compliments that I have received for the last 10 years. It's gotten very long. And what I do is on a day when I'm not feeling myself, I'm not feeling like I'm making progress, I've screwed something up, I open up that document, I just scroll it. 
and I land on something, you know, I'll land on a compliment that was offered to me six years ago, something Mm -hmm. I don't even remember. And I don't remember the person who offered it to me, but now it's back again. I double the power of a compliment Uh, by saving it and allow it to come back to me because we just discard the kindnesses that people offer us and focus on the negative things. And so if we stop discarding kindness and instead finding ways to multiply it, multiply its power, you know, create a resource for ourselves on days when we need it. Uh, I can't tell you how powerful that is when I open up that document and go, eight years ago, one of my students said this lovely thing to me. I can barely remember the kid, but now I feel good about myself again. The other thing I like to do is if you receive an email from anyone with any bit of kindness, Mm -hmm. you can do what's called snoozing the email. Every application, every email application allows you to do this, forward it to the future so I'll receive an email from someone. They'll say, you know, you are you did a wonderful job with the work this weekend. Yeah. I'll snooze it to some random point in the future. It'll arrive in my inbox the second time as a surprise, doubling the power of the compliment. We have to increase positivity in our lives in any way we possibly can because the balance for us right now is terrible. I know people are not receiving what they deserve. Yeah, because because you stated, as you stated, we're all looking at the negative. It's also what sells, right? And we tend to, because we tend to look for it, you know, yeah. it's a protective measure, but it's creating this kind of negativity bubble that we're all walking around in, right? Right. And, yeah. As an author, I can tell you, I remember the negative, like I can get a hundred positive reviews from a new, from newspapers <laughs> and then one will offer me a negative review. And that's the one I think about. And I, I'm trying like hell to train myself not to do that. But I know it's the wiring of my brain, but at least what I can do is take the other 99 positive ones, put them in a file and return to them again and again. So to at least let them, I can maximize the power of those and minimize perhaps the power of the negative. I think the book focuses on things you can do, but one of the things that it focuses on, which is super important is is what you don't do sleep. You are not doing anything. And so sleep hygiene is a huge huge issue for most people and i think that you you like basically you i could just photocopy that and hand it to my patients and it would be basically the same thing i tell them but maybe you can talk a little bit about your relationship with sleep and 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 why you put it in the book well if you can recover time that you're spending sleeping that can be enormously powerful to you. You know, if you sleep an hour or less every day, for example, if you're able to do that, suddenly you have an extra hour, your day is 25 hours long where everybody else's is 24. That's really enormously. That's, I can't tell you how much an extra hour a day means for people. I, I don't suggest that they should suddenly start sleeping an hour less, but what I suggest is always take a look at how you sleep. Cause when I'm working with a client and I say, how, how long do you sleep every night? They say, well, I need eight hours. And I say, all right, well, let's think about it for a minute. Do you need eight hours? Oftentimes that eight hours includes the 20 to 30 minutes they spend in bed watching television before they go to bed, but they count that as sleep, right? Or the half an hour they spend reading to make themselves sleepy before they go to bed. Now, reading is fine before bed, but don't do it in bed. You know, one of the one of the most important things you can do is just sleep when you're in bed. Anytime you open your phone, watch a TV or read a book in bed, you're telling your brain, we do a whole bunch of things here. So your brain doesn't actually know what to do when you climb in the bed. It has to spend time figuring out figuring out what we're doing here right now. So if the only thing you do is in bed is sleep, then when you lay your head down on the pillow, the brain doesn't have any question. It says, oh, I need to really release the chemicals that promote sleep right now, right? Because that's what our brains do. So yeah. removing everything from bed except sleep and perhaps sex, those two things are fine, but everything else is gone. Going to bed at the same time or about the same time every night and awakening at the same time or about the same time every morning is enormously important. People shift their sleep cycles on the weekends, for example. It just ruins their sleep cycles. You know, I go to bed every night sometime between 1030 and 11, and I wake up without an alarm every morning sometime between 4 and 430. I've trained my body to do that. And it is so wonderful to wake up without an alarm because most human beings startle themselves awake, right? You're in a blissful sleep and then it's like a gun goes off in your brain, which is the alarm. And then they maximize the problem by using the snooze alarm, which means I've startled myself awake. Now I'm going to put myself back into a sleep cycle. I'm going to cut that one off too and startle myself again. 
if you're walking around in the morning requiring caffeine in order to get yourself going, it's not because you need caffeine. It's because you're not sleeping properly. And once you start zeroing in on some of these things, adding white noise to your sleep, to your sleep cycle, because oftentimes when we wake up in the middle of the night, we can't identify what woke us up. We often think we just woke up when really probably what happened was a police siren or a cat meowed or your house creaked. You know, any one of those things causes you to awaken. You don't know what it was, but now you're awake. You've broken your sleep cycle. Now you have to go through that again. White noise will often eliminate all of those things. You know, all of those sounds will go away. You're more likely to sleep throughout the whole night. So suddenly Mm -hmm. someone who tells me I need eight hours of sleep, when we really look at it, they're in bed for half an hour, but that's not sleep. And oftentimes when they wake up, they sort of linger in bed for 20 minutes. That's not sleep. Both of those periods of time are really damaging their sleep cycle, not training their body to sleep properly. Once you get your sleep hygiene right, you will find oftentimes that you will sleep better for less time. And I am obsessed with the idea of being well-rested and recapturing as much time as you can in your day to do other things. Yeah, absolutely. No, I I, I totally agree. And and I struggled with that years ago and then, and probably for about a good 10 years now, I'm primarily sleeping along the same lines you do. And everything that you, you said about the bed, it should be for lovemaking and sleeping. That's it. Really. That's the main thing. Otherwise you will, uh, you'll have difficulty or or a lot of people sometimes think, Oh, I turn the lights off. That's when I go to sleep. Well, no, that's not how you kind of, it's a gradual progression to sleep. Right. And then making sure that you associate, like you said, the putting your head on the pillow with sleep alone is super important. Ritual. If you, if you start going to bed at the same time every night, your body actually gets you ready for sleep about two hours before that's when the first chemicals get released. Mm-hmm. And so if I'm going to bed every night at 1030, my body knows that at 830, even if I am out with my family eating ice cream, my brain will start releasing the chemicals that will allow me to go to sleep at 1030. If you're changing your sleep time all the time, your body doesn't know when to begin the process of falling asleep, which is why you toss and turn for so long, because you didn't allow your body to start that preparation period. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, any speaking engagements, anything going on? How is the book going? Is it, is it, is, is you, are you, yeah, you're getting a lot of good feedback. It's very nice to sync, like I said, very succinct distillation of some super good stuff. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I have, um, a wonderful publicist, which I always say is a blessing and a curse. You know, it's a blessing because she has me speaking all over the place and it's a curse because <laughs> she has me speaking all over the place, but it's been going really well. It's been well received. I received a lot of, uh, email from people. There's, action plans at the back of the book. And some of those action plans say sort of like, if you do that and you want to let me know, that would be great. And I'm getting tons of emails from people letting me know that not only are they reading the book, but they're engaging in some of the things that I suggest to make their lives better. So that's a wonderful thing to see. Excellent. Excellent. Any other plans for any other books, uh, fiction or nonfiction? I have a, I have another storytelling book. My first nonfiction book was on how to tell a story, story worthy. So mm-hmm. I now have a storytelling for business book that will be coming out. I also Excellent. have written a book on why storytelling is important, how it can, whether you're telling stories to yourself or on stage, just the act of storytelling can really be meaningful. And then I'm always working on my next novel. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, Matt Dix, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, I think we can wrap up here. Everybody out there, I highly recommend Someday is Today, 22 Simple Actionable Ways to Propel Your Creative Life from New World Library. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know you can find us on the web all over the place? Well, maybe not all over the place, but you can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us at Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, loads of places. Please look for us. And if you can, subscribe, like us, leave us a review, send us a comment, a criticism, Hey, we like to hear a lot from people. Go ahead, talk to us. That's why we're here. 
By the way, this is just a reminder to let you know that all of the material here is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you do need a therapist or a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati. Serenati.